Hi everyone, welcome to day number 39 of our 40 days of prayer and fasting as we're walking through the book of Romans. So grateful for many of you who have been with us this entire journey as we hope to finish tomorrow. And remember, tomorrow is when we kick off the big weekend at our church with revival services on Friday night at 7 o'clock and on Saturday night at 7 o'clock and then on Sunday morning at our regular time 10 a.m. worship service. All these with Reverend Lane Lohman. He'll be with us for the uh, revival. We have something for the children each night. We have some special singing that's lined up. Great time for all. And don't forget about on Saturday, our Big Gus Car and Truck Show, which starts at 11 o'clock and runs until 4 in the afternoon. So just a big weekend for the big weekend. And then, of course, after that, we'll be done with our 40 days of prayer and fasting. You'll no longer have Pastor Mark's face popping up on your Facebook every single morning when you get out of bed. So there, some of you will probably be relieved of that. But we are grateful, again, for your support of this time that we share every sun, every uh, weekday morning, and we hope you'll be in prayer for the big weekend. I want to say good morning to those who are joining us already. Uh, good morning to Daryl and Darlene. Good to hear from you guys this morning. Good morning to Forrest, and good morning to Donnie. If you join us a little later on, please make sure to say hello to us because it means so much, and we're able to say good uh, hello back to you as well. Hey, good morning, Helen. Good morning to you guys. Uh, all of you out there, and for those who have continued to follow this ministry online, we're grateful again for each one of you. We're looking in Romans chapter 16, and when we talk about Romans chapter 16, we had Paul sort of greeting the people yesterday, and it's important that we continue to encourage and greet others. And today, uh, we're going to look at something that he just, all of a sudden, it's like he interrupts his greetings, and he wants to make sure there's one last thought that he passes it along to the church in Rome. Now remember, Paul did not uh, plant this church, but it is a church that's very close to him. He's heard a lot of good things about it. And it's mainly made up of Gentiles. Paul has taken a lot of the book of Romans to dispute some of the arguments that he's facing, not only probably from the Roman church, but other churches about salvation through Jesus Christ alone, through faith in him and his sacrifice at Calvary, rather than having to maintain and know the Jewish laws. He's also talked about the fact that God has continued to reach out to the Jewish nation despite their rejection of their son, or of his son, excuse me, as Messiah. Uh, they, have, uh, they have rejected him pretty much as he's not what they thought was the ideal Messiah. Nevertheless, of course, we have to remember that the New Testament church was primarily planted originally by Jews. So we have Jews and Gentiles trying to work together, and of course, Paul emphasizes that, being one body in Jesus Christ who is the head. Hey, want to say good morning to Tamara, who's joining us as well. Well, Paul's going to, again, sort of interrupt his greetings that he started at the beginning of chapter 16 with some last important parts. And there's a couple of different words used between the NIV and the King James. I hope to emphasize both of them because I think they both make a good impression on the point that Paul's trying to make. So let's look at it together, shall we? Again, I want to encourage you to be praying for our revival services this weekend and I hope that you'll be challenged and convicted to be with us during those special times as we gather and, and try to get a little deeper in our walk with Jesus. All right, we're going to pick up with verse 16 of chapter 16. And of course, Paul has been greeting a number of people. Some of them we highlighted yesterday. If you weren't with us, you can catch all of our uh, previous messages, of course, on uh, YouTube if you can't go back on Facebook far enough. But he ends his greetings here initially with greet one another with a holy kiss. Evidently, that's significant to the way they greeted one another. Remember Jesus dined at a Pharisee's house one time and he uh, even took into consideration the fact that the Pharisee didn't greet him with a kiss and he was making a point about how the fellowship should be very obvious when we gather together. So greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings, of course, meaning that the ones that he knows of that he's helped to plant, maybe the church in Corinth, which is where he's supposedly writing this letter, uh, Ephesus, other churches, they're sending greetings as well. They're all encouraged by what they're hearing about the church in Rome. Then we pick up in verse 17, very important. I urge you, brothers, again, very, this is something that's close to his heart in the wording and in the phrasing here. I urge you, brothers and sisters, or brethren, depending upon what translation you use, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Another uh, way that King James phrases it is that cause divisions and offenses considering the theology which they've learned. So there's two people that Paul wants to point out 
to the Roman church. Evidently, this has been evident in other churches because he doesn't have any evidence of this taking place in Rome, but he wants to make them aware of it. Uh, this might have been a new obstacle that was unforeseen that was taking place or taking root in some of the new churches. One of the groups is that there were people who were causing division. And there is a potential for division in the church, particularly at that time, because it's made up of Jews and Gentiles. Not only then, though, but we still see it today. We see people who, for one reason or another, just like to cause division and strife. You see it in every church, and a lot of times these people think that they are crusaders for the good. I don't know that they are deliberately setting out to divide as much as they are just maybe like like to be patted on the back for leadership. They uh, like to be acknowledged for some of the things that they do. It's very important to them. And it's kind of a carnal attitude in which they are giving of themselves and coming to the church and serving, but they want to be recognized for that too. And so this sometimes causes division because they feel as though they're as important as someone else. And another thing they do though is, Paul mentions offenses. This is not necessarily the same people. Sometimes it is the same people, but there are some people that will just put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Sometimes I think of these people who kind of maximize minimums. They like to bring up controversial topics. They like to get into things that really the Bible doesn't speak about clearly, and it causes some stumbling blocks with people. They start to perceive things that are not being taught that are really of no significance to living the Christian lifestyle. I'll give you an example. Sometimes people fight about uh, end times and they, they bring up issues that aren't necessarily uh, beneficial because they bring division. Sometimes they bring, uh, sometimes issues are brought up about things of, uh, that are very surfacy, like dress or uh, styles or, you know, worship, maybe music, issues like that, which uh, they, they're stumbling blocks. And then it could be things that deal with the past versus going forward together and trying to be united as one front. Again, these kind of tie in together because we don't want to think of division in the church. We want to think of being faithful to the church's teaching and we want to be thinking of being unified and being one family, one body in Christ Jesus. It was so important to Paul that he felt like I need to interrupt this greeting so that I can pass along these last few things which probably were cropping up in some of the other churches. Paul goes so far as to say avoid them in King James and to keep away from them in the NIV. For such people, verse 18, are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. This need that they have to be recognized as someone who's either controversial, someone who feels that their opinion is very important, and basically they're getting a big kick out of being ones that are causing this division, that trying to sort of gather a team of those around them that have a sour attitude towards the leadership in the church or what's being taught in the church. And they're getting a kick out of it and a big ego boost. And that's what Paul's talking about. You need to avoid people like that who are just always looking to sow deception. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive, or King James says, simple people. So many times I've seen it, you've probably seen it too, it's very easy to draw a crowd of people who are ignorant. Now, I don't mean ignorant in the fact that they're stupid. I mean they're ignorant of the facts. They don't know everything about the circumstance or the particular situation that's being addressed. They have just got a bit and piece of the, the facts, and all of a sudden they're ready to jump in and, and hang and uh, eulogy someone for something they've done, and they really don't even know what they're talking about. It's important that we recognize that a lot of these wolves in sheep's clothing that Paul is talking about do approach those simple-minded, new in the faith, sometimes new Christians, sometimes young Christians, children, youth, etc., just to try to promote an agenda that they think they should promote. Again, maybe they're crusading for what they feel is the right, but truly within, they see these crusades as a way to become acknowledged or important within the body of Christ and it's really born out of a carnal attitude. Paul says to avoid these, to be aware of these, and it's important as he continues on uh, to know something that will help you to resist them. Listen to what he says. Everyone has heard about your obedience. He's talking about the church in Rome again. So I rejoice because of you. 
Basically, it hasn't happened yet to the church in Rome. But I want you to pay attention. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Paul is emphasizing here, as I think people like the FBI or the Treasury Department, they give us a good example. Whenever they want to spot counterfeit money, they do it because they're so ingrained in what real money looks like. They study real money, the actual thing. They become so familiar with its texture, its touch, the way it looks, the way it's printed, that they can spot counterfeit money immediately. Paul is saying basically the same thing. If you know what's right, if you know the good, and you concentrate on that, what's written in the law, what's written in the Word of God, if you concentrate on his teachings, the, the Gospels, the New Testament, then that's going to help you to recognize what is counterfeit. And so he says again, I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. You'll recognize what's evil for, at face value because you'll know it doesn't belong with the good. Why? Because you're so deep in the good. You recognize the good right away, and therefore what's contrary to the good, you immediately recognize as evil. And then he closes out with verse 20 on our study today. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. If you're walking with the Lord God, he's going to help the church. He's going to continue to strengthen the church. And these who would oppose the church are going to be crushed. They're going to be revealed for what they are, and they will not be effective in dividing the body of Christ. That's important teaching by the Apostle Paul. Tomorrow we're going to finish, Lord willing, chapter 16 and the entire book of Romans. I want to thank you for joining me throughout this book and throughout these 40 days of prayer and fasting. Again, one more day. I hope you'll share this study with your friends on Facebook. And I, today we pray for online ministry, which is what we've got here, which is what we'll have tonight with Carry Hope Ministries. And we hope to have some online ministry this weekend with Lane's preaching. We should hear his sermons uh, Friday, Saturday, and also Sunday. We'll have our regular Sunday morning worship service at 10 o'clock. But let's pray tonight for our online worship service with Carry Hope Ministries. Let's pray for other worship services that uh, are being done online that are truly Bible-based and truthful. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to share the gospel online. Help us to take advantage of that. It doesn't take a lot to just hit a share button. I pray that many who hear this today will do that when they have the opportunity, not just to share things that are going on in their community or funny things on Facebook, but to share the gospel that can really be life-changing and meaningful to people. We pray, Lord, you would take the online ministries and apply them to the hearts that need to hear them, some that cannot even attend church but are able to attend through this incredible technology that we hold. We thank you for it, Lord. We pray that your will will be done and that you will keep us one body in our churches, able, that is, to avoid division and those which would manipulate the simple or the new convert. Give us wisdom today, Father. Keep us deep in the word of God. Be with our revival services this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. I hope you have an incredible rest of your day. And I hope you'll join Crystal and I tonight for Carry Hope Ministries at 7 o'clock on our Facebook Live channel. God bless.